Welcome back to the Comic Book Historians Podcast. I'm Alex Grant. Today I'm joined by mystery and science fiction novelist and writer Alex Segura. We're here to discuss his own personal history and comics, as well as his new release, Secret Identity, a novel. Alex, thanks so much for joining us today. It's, uh, it's a pleasure. Like I told you many times, I'm a fan of the podcast, and it's a, a real treat to, to be a guest. Oh, well, thank you. Now, um, now, a lot of people don't know you currently live in New York. You're senior vice president at Oni Press, and you just released this uh, book, uh, Secret Identity, which I loved. Uh, thank you for mentioning the podcast in your acknowledgments. That was super kind. And I just kind of want to mention a little something about it before we get started on your own history in comics. It's an interesting concept with this almost unintentional ghost writer, and all that ensues in the 1975 comic book industry. It's a genius concept. The interesting thing is the idea of an unintentional ghost writer and their secret identity as the actual writer. Um, I just love the title. I love the concept. But before we go into that, let's talk about your own history, if that's okay. Sure, yeah. Um... You're Cuban-American, right? That comes up in a lot of your writings. You were born in 1980 in Miami, Florida. Tell us about growing up as a kid in 1980, the political situation of Cuba. How did that affect your growing up, your parents? Tell us about that. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I mean, my parents came over from Cuba shortly after, obviously, they hadn't met yet, but after the Castro takeover in uh, 1960, my mom was born, birth, her birthday is January 1st, so she has vivid memories of her party, her birthday party being interrupted by the news of Castro taking over. Um, so they came over, um, I was born in 1980, and there was always this kind of sense of other, like of another place that was home, but we'd never see, you know, like this idea that um, my family had been, my family, like many other Cuban families had been uprooted and taken away. So a lot of like Cuban uh, goes on a lot, of, you know, it was always top of the news in Miami as I'm sure it continues to be. Um, what was happening in Cuba, it was very much this sense of like detachment, like we were here in Miami and everything else was going, you know, other stuff was going on in Cuba that we, we just weren't part of because of this, you know, this man, a lot of the blame was laid out on Castro and his takeover. And it was a, it was an interesting way to grow up, grow up because I, I, I think it was fairly unique. I, I don't know, I didn't feel it very unique to me in that home was Miami, but there was also another home that I'd, I'd never get to see. Um, and I grew up a comic reader. I mean, my first comic was an Archie comic. Uh, I remember my mom picking it up for me at the uh, grocery store of Publix. Um, I think we were in the checkout aisle and I was about five or six. Um, and I just remember the Archie stuff presented this Americana that I wasn't really familiar with. Like in Miami, you don't have seasons, you know, it's always great weather, you know, it's, you know, it's culturally a melting pot and uh, just so different from, you know, the Archie Americana was, was very appealing because everyone everyone was friends it was just this very happy-go-lucky scenario and um it was a great introductory because introduction to comics because the stories were sitcom-ish you know in terms yeah. of format you know there was no continuity there was no overarching you know there were some dramatic stories i remember those particularly like um usually drawn by stan goldberg or um you know they, they'd feature the kids in some kind of peril those were fun, the life with Archie stories, but I really was drawn to the sitcom and the clean art style, like DiCarlo and Harry Lucy and things like that. Um, I obviously didn't know that, those creator names until much later. Um, and then my first superhero comic was a reprint of, you probably remember this, the Spectacular Spider-Man magazine, you know, those yeah. two issues that Stan and yeah. Romita did. Yeah. Um, I think the first issue was in black and white, but the second issue was in color. That's right. And it's still one of, I think, the best Green Goblin stories ever in terms oh, yeah. of you know, Norman Osborn is still around, he's still got his amnesia, and this was, is funny in retrospect, but they opened the story with, with somebody, J. Jonah Jameson, showing a film on the Green Goblin, yeah. <laughs> and so Norman Osborn, of course, then goes into, like, a cold sweat and becomes yeah. the Green Goblin, but... And, and, that, I, and that wasn't J. Jonah Jameson, but that was Captain Stacy, right? Oh, that you're right, you're right, yeah, you're right. You're I, right I love right. that issue, you're right, it's a great issue, uh-huh. It's so good, and, and Ramita, you know, drew everyone beautifully, but when he drew terror or like sheer anger he was yeah. he's so gifted he was so gifted and is yeah. so gifted and um i just i read that around the same time i picked up the archie comics and that really opened the door to superhero stuff and i became you know i just then i was obsessed and then i became like a, a regular a regular visitor to my newsstand and then when i discovered there was a comic shop down the street from my grandparents house the uh, dearly departed frank's comics and cards i would i would make myself known there whenever i had a couple dollars to rub together um and, th and that's an interesting transition from archie 
having the Ramita Lee Spider-Man be the gateway to the superheroes, that totally makes sense because a lot of people actually say that when Ditko left and Ramita came in, that they turned it into Archie, basically, right? Um, with Peter Parker as Archie, and uh, I think Mary Jane would be Veronica, and uh, uh, and 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 Gwen was like Betty, and then Harry Osborn was like Reggie, right? So so th this is interesting that that would be your gateway to superheroes. That makes total sense, actually. Yeah, I mean, Ramita, you know, Steve Ditko had this amazing quirky isolated yeah. style that you know pete got a lot more handsome and <laughs> you know all the characters became beautiful and so yeah the through line from like dan DiCarlo to john ramita was very close and um you know after that i was i was hooked and i started buying stuff that was more current um like eric larson on spider-man jim lee on the x-men um some batman stuff and you know once you're in a comic shop the floodgates open and you can start picking up back issues and i was really into justice league international and daredevil and things like that um i became obsessed with chris claremont's x-men i started reading the classic X-Men as it kind of you know the, the cool thing about marvel at the time is there was no real expansive book trade presence you know there were a few trades here and there so a lot of publishers reprinted classic stories through monthly periodicals, like something that Archie still does today through the digest. But um, so you had classic X-Men, which we printed from the beginning of Giant Size. And then you had Marvel Tales, which started reprinting classic Spider-Man stuff. So that was my education, kind of reading old back issues through reprints and then keeping up with the current issues. And um, I was a big Spider-Man guy, X-Men, Batman was my guy at DC. I, I, I did appreciate Superman, but I wasn't as into like the cosmic stories. I was not, I mean, I liked the Avengers, but I was much more into the outcasts and the mutants and, and things yeah. like that. Um, and then some indie stuff like Steve, Steve Roots and Mike Barron's assist. Um, oh Love yeah. And Rockets. Great. We're, we're close to the same age. So you're really saying like, I, yeah. I grew up on that stuff too. That classic X-Men reprint. I mean, to me, that was awesome. I, I don't even think I knew they were reprints when I was picking them up from the store until I yeah, found I didn't out understand. Later. I didn't understand until my dad, I, we went out to lunch. He, he was like kind of my doorway to comics. We would buy comics together. When I'd go over to his house on the weekend, he'd, he'd take me to the shop or to the newsstand and we'd pick up a few books. Um, also, he had been a comics reader as a kid too. So he explained to me, he was like, no, those are comics that came out when I was a kid. Like you're reading the books I read as a kid. And that, <laughs> that was, and I, I just loved it because I was getting this backstory that I didn't really have when i was reading the current stuff that was sure. so you know there were thousands of characters yeah running through. I, I think i think mark silvestri's x-men was coming out at the same time as some of that classic x-men and i don't even think i even understood what was going know, on at the time yeah like i just <laughs> knew i liked them a lot yeah 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 and i the X -Men seemed cooler they were just they were kind of outcasts and defiant yeah. and um the avengers were uh were the all-stars which was fine um but i was definitely into the outcasts like peter parker slash spider-man and yeah. daredevil was always like even though he had these great creative runs was considered sometimes a b-lister and i yeah. was reading like in the stuff i remember being really yeah. drawn to lee weeks on daredevil when he did that last right story with dg yeah. chichester that was great stuff um mm -hmm. but yeah it was like kind of comic dna coming in and um i stayed a fan and i went to college i i uh I started working in journalism. I was a reporting intern and an editor at different places. And um, I think it was early on in college when I was, I had just come off a, a reporting internship and I was realizing that the internship was not going to become a job that um, I reached out to Mike Duran at Newsarama, who is still the editor at Newsarama and, and Matt Brady, who is not the editor, but, you know, was there for a very long time. Totally like a cold AOL message. I just messaged them and that dates the conversation as well. Um, but I messaged them and I was like, hey, I'm a journalist, I'm a reporter and an editor, and I am a huge comic book fan. And I'd love to like, I mean, I, I read the, I was, you know, like you, I wasn't just a fan of comics, I was a fan of the history of comics. So as a kid, you know, I would even do like my own like fantasy football style pairings, like, what if John Byrne drew Spider-Man, and this was before he did, but you know, things yeah. like that, when you're yeah. like, kind of moving the pieces around to figure out, figure out what a great match would be. Um, and I'd always read you know, books about comics and the history of comics. And um, that was, so that was my first kind of comic book gig, interviewing creators. I interviewed Peter David about Young Justice. Oh, that's great. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and it was email, the early, the early days of email interviews. So, um, and Ed Brubaker was one of my first interviews for Point Blank, which was kind of the book that set up Sleeper in the Wildstorm universe. And, um, you know, they were giving me a lot of the kind of entry interviews, like, let's see if this kid can do it. And, um, 
I stuck around for a couple of years and eventually I saw Wizard Magazine had an opening for an associate editor and I grew up on Wizard. Um, I didn't have a ton of money as a kid of my own. Uh, so if I only had like five or six bucks, I would buy Wizard because then I'd at least know what was going on in comics and read the interviews. And that was really my gateway to behind the curtain as opposed to just reading the comics and enjoying the stories. I got to meet the creators and kind of get a sense of their personalities, which was right around the time of the image revolution, um, which was so exciting. And Valiant was huge at the time and DC and Marvel were doing Death of Superman and, uh, uh, you know, Nightfall and Heroes Reborn a few years later. So it was a very intense and epic time to be a, a comic reader. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, there, there was definitely like a cultural climax of the 90s that almost seemed to signal like the end of the old way, but you had to be there to feel that. Yeah, it was really a seismic moment in comics, I think. And you, and there was also like business news, like Marvel buying Heroes World and, yeah. you know, companies being born or, you know, you know, Marvel buying Malibu. I remember that was a huge story. These, these stories that are now kind of not footnotes, but like only referenced by insiders, but it was an interesting time to watch the industry grow and contract and then grow again. Yeah. Um, and so I reached out to Wizard. I applied. I spoke to Joe Yanarella, who is now at Bleacher Report. He's like a big wig at Bleacher Report. Um, and he was, he, I flew up to Congress, New York, which I thought, oh, I'm going to the big city in, uh, you know, Rockland County, New York is, is, is suburban. It's suburbia. It's not, it's not Manhattan by any stretch, but it was my first exposure to snow and the Northeast. And um, I got the job, which was amazing. And I was there for a couple of years and I got, that was really a crash course in working in comics full time. So I went to conventions. I got to meet a lot of, I got, I got to put faces to names, like people I would email or talk to on the phone. I became, you know, I got to connect with in person, which was really exciting. Um, and then after that, I moved now, what, back to what year, what year was that? Just so we're all on the same page. Early 2000s. So I think 2000. 2002, 2003. And then yeah, after that, go. yeah. And then after that, I moved back to Miami and worked at the Miami Herald again. And I started, um, reviewing graphic novels for the newspaper in addition to like just my job as an editor and working on the website um and that was fun because i got a ton of free books i got to review a bunch of cool stuff like Dave gibbons is the originals and the watchman reissue and stuff like that a lot of indie stuff um and i emailed my contact at dc david hyde and um i said i'm going to be in town in New York on vacation, I'd love to just visit the offices and say hello. And, yeah. you know, I'd never gotten a tour of the DC New York offices. I never, you know, it just felt like a dream. Um, and David said, sure, I'd love to see you. Would you want to apply for this job? And they had a job as a publicity manager at DC. And I said, yeah. okay, I hadn't even considered moving back to New York. I thought it was just going to be what it was going to be. And I was going to be in Miami. And that would be not to sound resigned. I just didn't think I'd come back to New York quickly. Um, and I ended up this all, all these conversations happened as I was already on vacation in New York. So I had to kind of scramble and, you know, buy a suit and prep for an interview. And um, I spoke to David, I spoke to the marketing people. I got to sit with Paul Levitz for the first time and, 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 and chat with him for the interview and, and I got the gig. And then I was back in New York and I was working at seed and, and um, really that was a great, I always knew I wanted to write. So I always knew I was going to eventually write my own stories, whether they were com this comic. Was, this was 2012. The the uh, the official job title was executive director of publicity, right? Actually, when I, I was, I had two stints at DC. The first there one was publicity manager and it started in 2006 to about 2009. There you go. Okay. Yeah, yeah. There you go. So that's where, that's where that started. Okay. It was a great opportunity as a publicist, well, as a journalist to shift over to publicity and learn how to be a publicist, but also as a, someone who wanted to write and write stories to just see how it was done and just soak up what these people were doing. Like people like Brad Meltzer, who I'd met when I was at Wizard, but I got to meet him and kind of see how he worked. Uh, you know, Scott Snyder, Gail Simone, Greg Rucka, you know, so many huge, huge talents. And just seeing not only how they behaved as professionals, but also they the work, you get to read scripts, you get to see the process. And I was probably the publicist that just loved hanging out in the editorial offices, yeah. just hearing, hearing what was coming up, sitting in different editors' offices and seeing what they had tacked onto the wall. So, um, And then as publicity manager, so then what would you do with that information? You'd figure out a way to promote it. You'd figure out the timeline, like, you know, do we, where do we announce this? Where do we show preview art? You know, you create a timeline for, for announcing, announcing the work and, and promoting the work. And, um, and this was an era where Wizard was still around, but kind of not as powerful as Wizard had been. You know, they weren't the tastemaker. And I think the challenge there was because 
Wizard had a web presence, but their web presence never really like broke out timed. You know, you had Newsarama, you had comic book resources, you had a bunch of other online outlets that, and I was partially guilty of this. You know, when, when I left Wizard and I came back, I did some freelancing for Newsarama and I'd get my subscriber copy of Wizard and then I'd run to Newsarama and we'd post the story like saying, hey, Wizard is reporting so-and-so. So the, the exclusivity, <laughs> you know, when you're, when you're a print magazine, your exclusivity is only as long as somebody looking at it and retyping the story. So, you That's know, we'd, right. cred, we'd credit <laughs> Wizard, but they no longer, I guess, had that, that same power. And I'm, I'm not taking credit for the, that alone. I was one of many reporters doing that. Um, so anyway, so as a publicist, you had to, you had to pitch around the story. You, you dealt with the comic trade. I was mainly the comic book trade person. So I would interact with Newsrama and Wizard and CBR and all those places. And, and that was a lot of fun because I came the comic book trade. So it felt like I was really just chatting with the people that I was contemporaries with. And um, I got to hang out and talk to the creators, but also see what the editors were doing. You know, people like Steve Wacker and Pete Tomasi and Joan Hilty and Mike Martz and, um, you know, uh, and D D Dan DiDio had just kind of was, had just set up shop there at DC as the head of, you know, the, you know, editorial. And also a lot of the Virgo editors like Karen Berger, Shelley Vaughn, Will Dennis. So it was, it was an education every day, just kind of seeing, I, my eyes were like starry eyed most of the time, but I tried to kind of keep it together. Um, yeah. But it was a great education and it was a really cool experience. And, and that's an interesting time because there's a lot of like the the like older people in comics and the newer people coming in. So you're kind of at that in between point where you're like interacting with like two different generations of creators, it sounds like. Yeah, you got to see a new wave of talent, like people that are huge names now were starting out then, especially through Vertigo. Like you had Jason Aaron do something. He did the other side at Vertigo and that was his big you know, launch. And then he did Scalped and then he started to really get some heat or Scott Snyder who started with American Vampire and then you know, took over Batman and, and became huge. Um, G. Willow Wilson did, um, did a book called Cairo and then Air. Um, maybe maybe not in that order but then she you know she went on to do amazing things so yeah it was interesting because you yeah you had the old guard and then you had some up and comers coming in and really establishing themselves it was just fun to see to be part of kind of the publishing machinery and um but at the same time I had just moved to New York so it was very it was a whole different world a whole different experience for me uh coming from Miami and comics was now my day job so, you know, not just writing about comics or being a fan of comics, but like the Mac machinery of comics. So I'd have to, I'd get a stack of the DC releases every week, which is amazing. It was amazing. And I was like, wow, this is heaven. Like I'm getting free comics like every week. Um, but it was your job. Like I had to read them. I had to see what are the publicity hooks here. Like what are the, what's, what's important? What did we miss? Like what, what made it through to the comics that we weren't able to maximize in the press? Um, and so I started thinking about other things creatively, and I was reading a lot of noir novels. Like, um, I'd always liked true crime. I'd always liked crime novels as a kid. Not, I mean, you know, I, stuff like I read The Godfather, probably a too young an age, the novel, which is really pulpy and dark. Um, and a lot of like Sherlock Holmes and stuff like that. So I always loved mysteries, but yeah. um, I got turned on to a lot of newer crime or, you know, other, other icons like Jim Thompson and Patricia Highsmith and um, Ross McDonald and then more current writers like Dwayne Straczynski and Laura Lipman and um, Megan you, Abbott. You were going back, you were exploring the genre on a, yeah. on a literary level. It sounds like. Um, yeah. I was really going to like, it was like a buffet table. I was yeah. getting a little bit of this, a little bit of that, but I, uh, did you like uh, what, like Chandler and Dashiell Hammett and all that stuff too? Yeah, I was more of a Chan yeah, Chandler was uh was the sweet spot. It was just like, you know, he set the tone for PI yeah. fiction forever. Like whenever yeah. you write a PI novel, you 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 owe some debt to Raymond Chandler, whether you're flipping what he did or you're just honoring what he did. Um, but a lot of the mysteries I was reading were really steeped in setting. So, you know, you read a Baltimore novel by Den not a Baltimore, you read a Boston novel by Dennis Lehane and you felt like you were touring the seedier sides of Boston or Baltimore by Laura Lipman or you know, Washington East by George Pelicanos. And um, I think in the, I was really homesick at the time, you know, New York is very, is amazing. You're full of people. There's people everywhere. You're surrounded all the time, but it can be a little lonely, you know, especially if you're coming from, a different place and it just feels you're isolated so I started to get really homesick and I thought well what if I just for fun started writing my own PI novel and I created this character Pete Fernandez who yeah. um was like me Cuban American and and uh had similar background and, and what and what year did you like conceive of of, of 
Peter Fernandez? You know, it's it's funny because the first edition of the book came out in 2013. And by then yeah. I had left DC, gone to Archie and come yes. back to DC. Yes. Um, but I was thinking about the Pete novels long before then. You know, I was thinking about it towards the end of my time at the first time at DC. And I was pecking away at this book and thinking about it. And um, I was I had a draft, you know, I had a draft. Um, and was, I remember sharing it with uh, John Cunningham, who was the SVP of sales or the VP of sales and marketing then. And I had never really shown it to anyone. And I printed it out at the work computer. And I was like, here, you know, just rip it apart. If it's terrible, don't tell me. And um, he read it. And he was like, you know, those first few pages got me hooked. And that's that's the first victory. Um, and I think people don't really recognize those early reviews or those early notes of encouragement. Like, writers don't forget that because it's yeah. it's do or die at that point. Like, you're so so fragile at that point that you're you don't even think about like if someone says, oh, this is terrible, it just could sink your momentum and yeah, you just say, well, for it's sure. not for me. Um, e even as an interviewer, that's true. I think uh, the Neil Adams and, and Jim Steranko, when I interviewed them and they just kept, they complimented me a lot after, like you really did this right. Now that totally, without that, I don't know if I would have even continued, you know? Yeah, yeah, it might kill your momentum. And um, so at the time, I was still writing the first draft and, and I moved from, from DC to Archie and at Archie, I oversaw all publicity efforts as opposed to being just part of the public. That was 2009 when this happened. Yeah, and but I did get my, my first comic book credit came at DC. I wrote a, a short story for a Halloween special that Mike Martz was editing, um, which I really owe him because at the yeah. time there was, it was frowned, you know, it was kind of frowned upon for DC staff to write at DC, which for good reason. I mean, at Marvel, remember Marvel in the 90s when editors were writing all the comics and it became this, issue um but M mike knew that i wanted to write and so it was a throwaway flash and frankenstein story but it was a lot of fun and it got me kind of thinking about the conventions of comics and the structure of a script and things like that um and that was my first credit and then when i got to archie i was obviously doing publicity but i i had made it known that i wanted to write and um mike pellerito who was uh, the president then threw me a few classic art stories. Well, I wrote one where they went to a comic convention. I wrote one where Archie had like four dates on the same night. And um, and that kind of opened the door to Archie Meets Kiss, which was my first like big project. Um, our CEO, John Goldwater said, you know, Gene Simmons wants to do Archie, an Archie crossover. And then I don't know what possessed me in the moment, but I said, I'd look, I'd love to write it. You know, I, yeah. I, I knew, I knew Kiss, I knew of Kiss and I, I obviously listened to the greatest hits, but I was by no means a Kiss obsessive. Cause that, that's kind of before our generation, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was more like, I mean, I love the Beatles. I love like seventies music, but yeah. for whatever reason, Kiss was a little bit of a blind spot, but I knew enough yeah. to be able to write a story about them. And so, and with Archie Meets Kiss, we brought in Francesco Francavilla to do the covers. And I think that helped you know, recalibrate how people looked at the character. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't just like this classic style. He could be interpreted in different ways. And that was that was that was a big game changer. And around the same time a little after that, a few years after that, I moved back to DC. And that's when Silent City was ready to come out. And then it came out from a very, very small um publisher, Cadoris Press. And uh, it was like a, a you know a boutique publisher and eventually got picked up by Polis Books and and they reprinted Silent City and then published the rest of the Pete series. Yeah. And and then just so people don't know, yeah, the Silent City is the first of the Peter Fernandez um series. There's five of them from what I understand. And then there's they got mm -hmm. their Anthony Award nominated series, um uh, Silent City, Down the Darkest Street, Danger Sends, Blackout and Miami Midnight. And I love the covers. I love the neon of the covers. Oh, yeah. uh, I I think that's just so much fun. Um but that being said, the, you touched upon it, is you have a long history of implementing music into comics. And what, what's interesting about that is that's, that's not easy to do, to converge uh, an auditory medium into a visual medium like comic books. But um, all the samples I've seen, which we'll talk about some also, you know, like Archie meets the Ramones and uh, the Archies. And there's something about the way those are presented that I, I feel like I'm feeling the music as I'm reading those, how did music make its way in? And I noticed that with Secret Identity, there's references to the Velvet Underground, um, things like that. So how does how did music kind of get involved in what you do? Yeah, I mean, music's always been a passion of mine. I was in bands in college and early on when I first moved to New York. Mm, so you're in a band. Okay, there you go. 
I was, yeah, not anymore. I don't have time. I mean, I wish I still kind of, I can mess around on the guitar and be okay, but I, I barely have time for that. But um, it's just one of those things you give up. Yeah, music's always been a big part of it. And um, when Matt Rosenberg and I were writing Ramones and we were writing B-52s yeah. and things like that, he's a music guy too. So we would always think about it. How do we, how do we evoke the feeling of listening to music um, through comics, which is so hard because there's no audio element to it. It's not like you can play some chords, but I think we knew enough about the lingo of being in bands and touring and things like that, that it, we tried to give it this sense of authenticity. Like the Archie's book drawn, drawn by Joe Eisman. and it was an ongoing series. That was my first ongoing book. Um, we had cameos each issue, but we needed to have one overarching story. So it was like the story of the Archie's on tour and they met all these bands like Churches and Tegan and Sarah. They had a dream sequence where they met the monkeys, Blondie in the modern yeah. day. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Uh, and, and I love how the art kind of changed on the on the one that uh, takes place in the 60s. Um, this is so well done, yeah. Oh, cool, yeah, Joe Joe was great. He's like so underrated. I think he, he deserves all the praise. He, um, he was able to draw it in a classic style to, you know, Archie gets bonked on the head by a guitar yeah, and then he has this dream right. sequence where he's playing with with the monkeys and then joe did it in the classic style and then r2 wakes up and 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 you know there's a a knowing wink at the end but yeah that was a lot of fun and yeah really we wanted to write a story about friendship and you know it sounds depressing but about failure you know sometimes you don't succeed but you still you know it's about the the journey and the friends you make on the way and the personal relationships and so that was the big thing and i was bummed that the series ended but you know sales numbers dictate what things do you know what what continues yeah i love pop culture references pop culture history so it spoke to me when i was when i read it so oh good now you're also like the dark uh, uh, an editor of the dark circle um series of comic books at archie so you were editing like the black hood in 2015 um can you tell us about that because you also edited uh, some work by like mark wade how is it like kind of editing you know, these um, creators and tell us about that stint uh, with Archie with the Dark Circle titles. Yeah, that was fun. I mean, when I came back, I was at DC for a couple of years after my first stint at Archie and then DC decided to move to Burbank and I couldn't make that move. So um, I started talking to Archie and they said, you know, we'd love to have you run our PR department. And I asked if I could also do some editing because that was something I was interested in. And they said that they wanted to relaunch their superheroes and and that that was really it and so i was intrigued by that um they'd done some stuff they did the fox the first fox miniseries yeah. by mark mark wade and dean haspiel um and i came in with a pitch and my idea was to really treat it more like a network as opposed to a big overarching continuity that you needed to really understand to get any of the books um and so i treated it more as like a genre exercise so the black hood which was dwayne straczynski and michael gatos who obviously, you know, co-created Jessica Jones, but um, that was our crime book. And The Shield yeah. by Chuck Wendig and Adam Christopher and Drew Johnson was your espionage spy book. And something like The Hangman by Frank Thierry and Felix Ruiz was the horror book. And and so on. And you know, we, we didn't get past that. You know, we had that first wave of titles. We had The Fox also, which was the second arc of the Wade Haspiel book. And that was much more like superhero hijinks and comedy and adventure. Um, it was great. I mean, it was, I learned on the job, which was challenging, but, you know, Paul Kaminsky, who's now a, a group editor at DC was extremely helpful in giving advice and helping me like kind of learn the ropes. And I, I credit him with showing me just how the mechanics of editorial, as opposed to, you know, the over the style, but, um, you know, that was, that was interesting. It was, it was really, you know, the passion for those characters is so strong, but I think the response was pretty good to that, those iterations. And it didn't take anything away from what you'd read before. So, you know, there was previous Black Hoods, but the new Black Hood was a different person and the new Shield was a different person. So it's interesting to see those characters kind of live on in their own way. Right. Um, but it was, it was, it was a learning experience and it was pretty invaluable, I think. And th there's also a, a history that a lot of companies do where, just to kind of renew their trademarks, they, they use it. They might be totally different secret identities of those characters, you know, like the, the vision at Marvel um, had, a, there's another vision before. So th right. this kind of sounds like an exercise of, of that in a sense too, but in, in, a, in a good creative way that, um, uh, that, that that's awesome that, that, and it sounds like you really kind of cut your teeth on uh, even further on the creative aspects of comics rather than the public relations of, of the company. Um, so that, that that's a that's a, that's great, and that sounds like then that leads into a lot of more more comics as far as editing and writing. And so I want to kind of ask you about the Archies because we mentioned it, but 
Was there any supposed synergy of any kind between that and the Riverdale show? Uh, was there ever, ever intended anything like that? Or were there any things you had to stay conscious of? Um, not so much. I think, you know, the benefit, I think, of being at a smaller company was we were always in contact. You know, Roberto Aguirre Sacasa, who is the showrunner of Riverdale, was the chief creative, is the chief creative officer of Archie. So he had a direct line to the company. And if any, you know, there was good communication. So it was more like, how do we capitalize off this awareness and remind people of the connective tissue so that people that are watching Riverdale realize, oh, this is Archie, the comic book. And then they go to the comic book and kind of engage with that. Yeah. Um, so it was much more about like, how do we help each other as opposed to like, we can't do this because it's on the show. Right. Like, there you go. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. And it was also like, I think at that point, which was a testament to the flexibility of the character, people understood that this was an iteration of Archie as opposed to like, you know, the only version. And so people were flexible with how the character was interpreted, which was cool. Yeah, and I noticed that that seems to be a theme at at Archie the company that there can be different interpretations of these characters. They don't all have to be in the same continuity. And uh, think of it as a multiverse. And and this is Archie meets meets zombies, or you know Archie right. meets Punisher. You know you know the, it, it's it's a fun exercise because I think those characters are so almost elemental now to pop culture that you can do stuff like that, and consumers will just have fun with it. I think I think that's a real unique kind of thing whereas i think in superheroes people get upset they're like that's not how it's supposed to be right yeah and that doesn't count and there's never yeah. really been continuity at archie like there's yeah. there's consistency like jughead likes to eat burgers and if you change that you're probably <laughs> changing his intrinsic characteristics or yes. veronica is rich and if you change that it might not be veronica yeah. unless you do it in a way that gets her back to her status quo so there's yeah. consistency but there's no continuity and so i think when um you know i think when john goldwater took over the company there was a sense that Archie as an IP was heading into the space of like Popeye or Betty Boop, which is not a bad space, but more yeah. like a retro nostalgia yeah. brand. He yeah. really, he really stemmed that tide and pivoted and made it a much more uh, fluid brand and something that could change and adapt for the times, which is amazing. Like now you see so many different iterations of the characters, which is cool. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when I was watching that first Riverdale episode and him and his teacher were in that car. And I was yeah. like, wow, this is not the same. Yeah, yeah. I'm all intrigued. Older, I want to see yeah, more. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, so now and and I and I see this a lot, you know, because I've, I've researched your other interviews. Um, you were co-president of Archie Comics in 2017. I think from what I understand, you oversaw the company's editorial and communications. What What is a co-president? Uh, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, it's the title in itself doesn't define itself. You know, when you say like SVP of sales and marketing, you kind of know what the job entails. But co-president was a way of saying like a lot of a little bit of everything. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I touched new biz, like new biz development, like partnerships, um, editorial oversight of the new stuff. Uh, but it was all done in in a team setting. So, mm -hmm. you know, obviously, John decided the big picture stuff as the CEO and Mike Pellerito, the other president, was had a big say in things. So. It was it was such a small shop that and it continues to be a, a very tight knit group that um, a lot of stuff was just done together, which was great. It was a nice way to work. Um, it sounds like co-publisher. Would that also be a way to describe that? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, it's really just, you know, having a voice in the room, uh, which is important. And um, you know, just growing the brand and trying to make, you know, whether, whether it's a business thing or a, a, a creative thing like having input on those decisions and it was it was a blast i mean i i've grew up on those characters so to have had any influence on what happened with them is an honor yeah absolutely that's great so then and you also edited titles like archie meets batman 1966 those mike all red covers are awesome dan parents art awesome um you edited uh well, archie katie keen betty and veronica now, mm -hmm. with these different titles, although they're all Archie characters or Archie style characters, when you edit, do you have to keep like target demographics in mind? And are they different between those books? Yeah, they vary. I mean, I think the big shift is when you're doing like classic Archie, you're obviously doing something that's family friendly and for all ages, you have to keep that in mind. Whereas you're doing something, the shorthand we used was New Riverdale, but that was, you know, we phased that out. But the idea is like, Archie stories that evoked Riverdale that actually predated Riverdale, like the Mark Wade, Fiona Staples, Archie stuff was in many ways what spurred people to understand Riverdale and came out first. But in that world, we, the shorthand we use was new Riverdale, but that's a little bit more YA leaning. Um, it never veers into adult, but then you have stuff like Dark Circle, which was much more like our HBO content. Like there was, uh, you know, some adult language, some 
the violence was more intense, but it was also a different imprint. So yeah. we were okay with that. So yeah, you always have to kind of know what your audience is and you obviously want to ho hopefully expand your audience, but um, we tried to keep those things in mind. A little more on Peter Fernandez, and then we kind of go to kind of off comics into your writing in other in other media. Some of the themes in like your part three, Peter Fernandez, um, first, it's about an ex-newspaper man. So you're an ex-newspaper man, right? Yeah. Cuban also, right? I mean, Peter mm -hmm. Fernandez. And yeah. uh, but then he turns into a PI. He wants to redeem himself, you know, uh, by helping people. He's alcoholic. You know, he's got baggage. Um, so there's a bit of a redemption arc to the character, which uh, which I find interesting. But it's also some of the themes. Like I think part three, there was uh, pro Castro killers uh, mentioned in it, right? So living, as you said, in uh, in exile as a Cuban exile. What is your feeling toward Fidel Castro, and how did that affect um, the your depiction of those pro Castro killers in part three of Peter Fernandez? I should zoom out and say that every time I, each of those books is whatever I was obsessing over at the time. Like I, I never wanted the series to feel just episodic where the character doesn't change. I wanted the Pete that you met at the beginning of whatever book to be very different from the Pete at the end. So at the end of, you know, the book's been out for a while, so I'll, I'll, I, I won't spoil it too much, but at the end of Dangerous Ends, he's, he's on the run, you know, stuff has happened. Uh, in terms of the Castro stuff, I'd read a lot of books about Cuba and the Cuba Miami dynamic and the, you know, the, 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 you know, the opposition between Cuba's government and the Cuban exile community. And it's all things are complicated. Nothing is ever black and white. And go. obviously, uh -huh. you know, so I wanted to show some of that, but obviously also note that, you know, Castro was not a good guy and what he did was not a good thing. And, you yeah. know, you, you know, you, you look, you, whether he did it under the auspices of being a revolutionary and I'm sure he has supporters like any, any, you know, uh authoritarian has but that doesn't mean that you're right you know just because you have some people behind you um so i wanted to i wanted to show some of that historical texture in that book i wanted to show that pete's background you know touched on uh, things that went deeper the roots went deeper and went back to cuba and i wanted to show that and um and not make it a typical pi novel so i had flashbacks to pete's grandfather in cuba escaping cuba during the the uh the takeover i had flashbacks to pete's dad who is a, a presence throughout the series even though he's never alive in the series like from page one he's passed away um so yeah and that was a great answer and i appreciate that oh thanks part four is about like a cult leader um, just just really fun things that are kind of spooky that you you bring up in the Pete Fernandez um, series. And, and it's cool that there's a, the dynamic and the variety of them. Um, in 2018, you co-created and co-wrote the Lethal Lit podcast, six episodes for iHeartRadio about Tig Torres, a woman uh, dealing with the lit killer in the city of Hollow Falls. And the murders were based on classic literature. Tell us about that experience and how it sounds like it'd be different writing for a podcast. Is that right? It's a different medium. Yeah, it's totally different. And there was a learning curve there. I mean, I'd written scripts, obviously, for comics, but comics are a visual medium. So you're writing to the artist and you're deferring to the artist to create the imagery. With with audio, you, you can't say you can't show anything visually. It's obviously audio. So even the cues have to be audio based. So when you... When someone enters the room, you have to make a note like sound effects, door creaking, and then the the conversation has to be a little bit perfunctory. You have to say, "Hey, Alex, how are you? I'm fine, Bill." You know, like you have to kind of explain. <laughs> you know, like it's like writing for radio, right? I mean, yeah, that's you're writing for is. radio basically, and um, and that's just like kind of the nuts and bolts of it. But I was also that was one of the first times I was writing pure YA. It's YA podcast, whereas you know the Archie stuff was YA, but not defined as YA. And so what what's YA? Young adult, and the idea being like you're you're kind of experiencing a character's coming of age in some ways, not necessarily. Uh, you know, whether it be professionally or personally or some kind of moment of truth. And, you know, the emotions are ramped up because you have younger, a younger cast. And when we're younger, we're, I guess, much more not, you know, not as jaded as we are now. But um, I really looked back at shows that uh, I had a fondness for that, you know, kind of touched on that high school mentality, mainly the stuff like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, like yeah. um, this idea of a crew or, you know, a little bit of the Scooby-Doo stuff. Like, you know, you have this crew of young teenagers trying to do what what the adults couldn't accomplish. And so to and I got to co-write the series with Monica Gallagher, who I went on to co-create the Black Ghost with. Um, 
and that was a lot of fun because Monica has a great knack for dialogue and, and character quirks. And I'm much more of a plotter and just like, you know, the mystery person. So I wanted to make sure that the, the big reveal at the end caught everyone off guard and, you know, you had enough red herrings and you had enough clues. And yeah. a lot of the fun was like digging up clues from literature and like dropping those into the story, like yeah. um, Dracula or the crucible or things like that. Like, I, I went back to my own like English lit roots as a kid <laughs> in high school. Like what were the books we had to read in high school? And that was a lot of fun because I got to revisit some of the classics and some of the books that I were defining to me as a writer, but um, you know, people had to read them in school. If that many more people then could relate to the podcast as well. Yeah. I think there was an awareness for those books uh, because they were part of the curriculum, I think across the country, like, especially for people our age, like the books we had to read um, and, and that were perpetually like continue to be read by high schoolers. So that I think was the touchstone for a lot of stuff. And it was a lot of fun. The response was great. And I think there's a point in audio writing where you kind of hand it off. We handed it off to the showrunner, this yeah. guy, JB Blanc, who um, is also an actor. Um, and it was just so interesting because as a novelist, you control everything. As a comic book writer, you control, you're basically the screenwriter and the director is the artist. So you kind of hand the script off and hope that they, yeah. you know, kind of adapt what you do and add to it. Um, and in audio, it's very similar. You're handing it off to the, the recording engineer or the director and he or she manages that part of it. And we got to be in the room. We got to see a table read, which was wild to see actors reading your, your script and then uh, watch them record their parts and listening to the final product was really it was just a treat. It was just like a, a unique experience for me. Yeah, that's fun. And you would actually write a sound effect in the script. Is that right? Yeah, kind of. Well, you would note. You would note it. And then the producer would do whatever with that. That's fun. Yeah. yeah in comics, you have to specify like literally foom or crack or, yes. you know, whereas in audio, you just note, OK, SFX door opening or SFX hand slamming onto table like and they can always tinker with that and, and do what 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 they want but at least right, you're kind of right. giving them a guide um and it's interesting because the audiobook of secret identity has those comic book sequences but they're done in an almost audio drama way it was just really neat we can get to that i guess when we touch on that but. yeah which i'm excited to talk about um because I, I i noticed the red herring and i'm not gonna say what it is in secret identity that uh, that i was actually myself going up the red herring tree <laughs> for a while yeah now in 2018 you wrote uh, well you wrote a story in where we live by image comics about the eyewitness account of Layla tyree about the las vegas shooting um, mm -hmm. Tell us first how that shooting affected you and how you got involved in writing that short story. Yeah, I mean, gun violence is so, such a prevalent problem in our country. It's just, it's insane and it's it's costing so many lives. It continues to be a problem. And, you know, we've, we've moved far beyond thoughts and, you know, quote unquote thoughts and not to get too political, but quote unquote thoughts and prayers solving anything. I mean, we need some like serious legislation. So, you know, what happened in Vegas was catastrophic even in comparison to other mass shootings not to compare and contrast but it was just like such a a terrible situation and then um jh williams the amazing artist and was editing this book with will dennis who i knew from my days at dc and they reached out and said we have some eyewitness stories um we'd love a writer who has like a journalistic background to talk to these people or at least read their um their stories and, and put them into comic book form and so i got to work with um Marco uh, Finnegan, who's a great artist, um, and and do one of those. I did two of them, and uh, it was just, it's it's so intense to read these these stories of people like literally running for their lives or watching people be gunned down. It was so heart wrenching, and um, I felt it was it was a huge responsibility to have to craft those stories and then relay them and do justice to their stories, but also have a message and a theme. Um, it was hard. And it's also, it's hard to be succinct in any medium. It's hard to like, you know, with a novel, you can write it as long as you want. With a short story, it's much harder. You have a couple thousand words to create a vignette. Like in a, by vignette, I mean an emotional response as opposed to like a three act structure. Um, and so, you know, it was a challenge and it was, such an all-star crew of creators in that book. So it was really an honor to be part of it. And that was the first time anything I'd, I'd written was in an image publication. So that was cool to see as well. 2019, this was a fun one. I, I enjoyed flipping through it. This was the, the Black Ghost for New Wave oh, cool. Comics, 2019. It's about reporter Laura Dominguez, also from Miami, mm -hmm. investigating, becoming the vigilante, the Black Ghost. So there's definitely a theme of, you know, these Miami-based investigators you know um, <laughs> yeah. kind of transplanted into a new place but in this case becoming a vigilante and almost like 
the lethal links in a sense. So can you tell us first about writing in the perspective of a female vigilante or female investigator? I know that you share roots as far as the Cuban heritage, being from Miami, being able to speak from that perspective, but how do you then also go into another gender and tell us about that in context of writing the Black Ghost or co-writing the Black Ghost? Yeah, the Black Ghost um, sprung out of Lethal Lit in many ways. The, you know, Monica Gallagher and I became fast friends and our collaboration was so painless. And that's really hard to find collaborators that you not only, you know, you like them as people, but you also enjoy working together and you feel like the, the final product the union of your work is greater than you could have done by yourself. And, and so I think working with Monica is that kind of collaboration where she adds so much and I add so much and the, the final thing is, is greater than the sum of its parts. Um, and so we went back and forth, we finished Lethal Lit and I said, do you wanna work on a comic stuff? Because Monica is a comic book writer and artist. She, uh, she's done so many amazing things for different places. Um, and we came up with this idea of the Black Ghost and we wanted to, in the same way that Pete the Pete Fernandez books honors the PI genre, but also flips the script on a lot of stuff. You know, Pete, like many private eyes, is, not, is a hard drinker, but he's also kind of in recovery and he's dealing with that in a way that I didn't see a lot of other PIs do it. And um, we kind of flipped the flu a few of the tropes. I wanted to reapproach the idea of the street level kind of crime fighter, especially the legacy aspect of it. Like a lot of times you, you see not to you know, criticize anyone, but I wanted to really look at it in a closer way. Like what pushes someone to take on these, this costume and decide to become a superhero. And um, I'm pretty proud of the twist at the end of the first issue. Cause you go into the first issue, you think it's a story about a reporter chasing the hero. You don't assume that the reporter is gonna then become the hero. So it's about Lara Dominguez, who's this obsessive um, journalist with her own personal problems um, in this new, in this in, in the city of Creighton, which was our love letter to kind of Gotham City and, and Hub City and places like that. Um, and so in, in terms of writing outside of my experience, since you know I'm a, a straight man and, and Lara Dominguez is a, is a woman, you know, obviously Monica was a great resource, you know, you know, mm. she could speak to a lot of things that I didn't know and and we we kept a great you know, dialogue going there. So I think that was the main, the main thing there. And um, she had, and, and it sounds like she kind of helped provide insight into things that you may not have considered on your own. Totally. Yeah. And, um, and so the idea there was to really catch people off guard by the end of the first issue. And so you read the first issue, you think it's going to be about La Lara, Ch La Laura chasing around this vigilante, this great vigilante, and then he dies at the end and of the first issue. And she, the, that first arc is about her journey deciding to become the next Black Ghost. And that that was kind of a, you know, a little nod to the DC heroes I loved as a kid, like the legacy heroes, uh, like Our Man and things like that, where there's another iteration of the hero in a generational story. Um, and so that was a lot of fun and really writing a vigilante crime fighter story as crime fiction, kind of blending my favorite stuff about crime fiction with superhero stories. And I really leaned into stuff like The Question, the Danny O'Neill run, Miss mm. um, Tree by Max Collins and Terry Beatty and things like that. So it sounds like you, you, whenever you explore a genre in a specific medium, you check out previous works in that to see about style and things. That tunes you in more in that sense to like comic history moments as well, which, which is awesome. Yeah, I mean, I try to immerse myself in what's happening in that space. If I'm going to be part of that space or add to it, I always want to be, I want to be additive. I don't want to just do something that's been done before. Like I wanted to definitely evoke crime fiction and superhero crime fighters in a different way. Like I'm not saying it's totally like groundbreaking, but it's, it was something that felt new to me. And look, at the end of the day, and I think this is a truism of any kind of creative stuff is that you have to write the story that only you can write, but that you want to read, you know, that you're obsessed with. So yeah, that's true. That way, it's actually fun also to do it. Yeah, exactly. Now, this is a whole different kind of direction. But Poe Dameron Freefall <laughs> yeah. uh, 2020, uh, you wrote uh, the origin of Poe Dameron in a Star Wars novel. He was partially orphaned, seeking adventure with the Spice Runners. How'd that come about with Lucasfilm? And how were those discussions? Were you given an outline of what technical things they just needed to have in there? How did that all happen? Yeah, the Poe Dameron book, it, it's funny. I got an email from Lucasfilm and it was very general. It was, you know, would you ever want to do something with Star Wars? And that, you know, for someone like me who wears a ton of hats, it could have meant anything like editing, writing, publicity. And so I just said, yes, I said, whatever, you know, whatever you guys want. And then it became, as we drilled down, 
they explained that they wanted to do Poe's origin story, uh, a YA novel set um, between Return of the Jedi and um, the first of the new trilogy. Um, and they wanted it to basically be the connective tissue between Rise of Skywalker and Poe's origin story, kind of setting up a lot of the things that you'd see in the film. Um, and so I've never, I was never like a traditional outliner with my novels. I would outline a little bit and write and outline again. And it was not, not an ideal process. It made rewriting intense, but um, when you're doing work for hire stuff, you have to present the outline. So we talked on the, we had a conference call, which was great and kind of brainstormed. And really what I wanted to do was write a crime novel in space. I, I, I yeah. wanted it to feel yeah. like a, a gritty noir adventure, obviously a YA adventure, but in space, in the world of Star Wars, um, and really explore what the underworld was like in the Star Wars universe, which to me was the most, one of the most interesting parts of Star Wars. Um, and they were cool with that. And so I outlined it in, in, in detail, about a 10 to 15 page outline, where I literally broke it out by chapter. Um, and I was really pleasantly surprised by how much creative leeway I had. You know, you never know going in dealing with someone else's IP, how much wiggle room yeah. you're going to have. Um, but they really wanted unique voices. They wanted those unique voices to create characters and add to the mythos as opposed to just like play the greatest hits, which was refreshing for me. So, you know, a lot of those characters were things that were created in the novel, like the spice runners that Poe gets pulled away from. Um, to, and to me, it's not just about Poe, it's about Zori Bliss, who you see for maybe five minutes in the movie played by Carrie Russell, and she's this mysterious masked figure, a lot like Boba Fett was in the original trilogy, like such visually so cool and obviously important, but this book also gave you the weight and the reason why she was so important, like the, backst the backstory with Poe, um, what the relationship was like, and I like that it's subverted and wasn't just a, oh, a romance, it was, so, it was more, it was about a friendship that sometimes became romantic but wasn't just purely like uh, a spurned lover because I felt that was too easy um and for me it was as much a Zori Bliss novel as it was a Poe Dameron novel and it was a lot of fun to immerse myself in Star Wars and it was such a nice like sea change from like the very gritty like reality-based PI novels I was writing to doing something um you know go you know that was in another literally in another galaxy and dealing with different planets and spaceships and because I'm a sci-fi kid too I love Star Wars go. I love Star Trek I love you know I love science fiction and so it was a lot of fun to kind of stretch those muscles and um the, I think the only drag was that it came out during it was like the pandemic had just started when it came out and I think the pandemic you know officially stuff started to shut down in March and then of 2020 and it came out that August so I didn't really get to go to like um Obviously, these are trivial problems compared to like the major issues happening. But there wasn't the big tour of going to like a convention yeah. and and talking to people about it. Yeah, I totally get it. Yeah, but maybe someday. But it was it was a thrill, and it was really the the author community of Star Wars authors was so welcoming and friendly and po positive, and um, and the fans were really great. And I think they appreciated the nuance that came from the book. That you know, it wasn't just like oh, Poe is a spice runner. Like there's a reason why he got swept away by the spice runners. It ties into his origin. It ties into his parents. And um, I just had a lot of fun creating those new characters, like the spice runners that he put he he teams with. A lot of the villains. There was this. Um, uh, Sila Troon is this officer who's like tasked with chasing down Poe, you know, and uh, it was it was just cool. And it was a and um, I'm doing a short story for an upcoming anthology, a Star Wars anthology that doesn't play with any of those characters, but it's just fun to be in that and be able to kind of do stuff in that space now and again. Two more questions, and then and then we're talking about secret identity. All right. <laughs> so now um, now 2020, you left Archie and you, you became uh, senior vice president at Oni Press. What led to that transition? Yeah, so it was last May when I when I signed up with Oni. Um, I think you know I had just I had been with Archie about a decade on or off, and you know all good relationships there. There was no no acrimony or anything like that. It was it just felt like it was time to kind of try something else, and it was a good opportunity to be part of a publisher that has a great reputation with creators, a great reputation with um, in terms of its the kind of books it publishes, and it's just a gear shift from doing traditional like IP based publishing to something where you're much more in conversation with the talent, where it's really, how do I help you as a creator actualize your vision for a book as opposed to, um, these are the characters and this is the assignment, please do that. And I, it's not it's not that one is better than the other, but it was more, okay, let me try something else and see how this works for me, especially as, as my own creative career was kind of 
burgeoning and becoming bigger and more important. It was, it just felt like the right move at the time. And um, it was nice to kind of refocus my day to day as opposed, you know, at Archie, you get to do, you get to wear a thousand hats, which was fun. But here at Oni, it's like, I have a kind of a clear, clearer path, I guess. Now then there is uh, two short stories more recent, more 2020, 2021, mm-hmm. uh, Red Zone about Raul Alvarez and 90 Miles about Joaquin Carmona. Are those kind of like uh, exercises in the genre as you're working on a bigger item? Tell us about those. You know, in terms of short stories, I go when I'm, invi- I'm like a vampire. If I'm invited, I will go, I will write a short story. I don't act, I don't write them as part of my like creative journey. Yeah. Like I, you know, I don't like sit back and say, oh, this will make a good short story. Let me do that. It's if someone invites me and says, I'm doing this anthology, can you come up with something? I usually there have a few ideas that are like percolating that aren't novels on their own. Um, so Angel Cologne, who is a, a crime writer and editor, was putting together an anthology called Paquetulo Sepas, which is was to benefit Puerto Rico in the wake of Hurricane Maria. Mm. Um, and it was pretty close to the deadline. And I had never written a noir story in sports. You know, I wanted to write a football mm. noir about a kid in college, like a backup quarterback who's thrust into the role of starting quarterback. And the challenges he faces, not only as the guy stepping in for the hero, but also as a Cuban American kid in a predominantly white school. Uh, And so I wanted to do that, but also do it succinctly. It's a short story. So I couldn't really touch into a lot of the nuance of it, but it, I was blown away that it won, it won the Anthony award for best short story. And the Anthony's are like the people's choice awards basically for, for crime fiction. And it's valuable because it's readers that are voting as opposed to like a panel of judges. It's the readers who have right. actually read the story and, and, and liked it. And so that was a thrill. And um, 90 Miles was part of an anthology called Both Sides, edited by Gabino Iglesias, who's also a great crime writer. Um, and the idea was to write a border noir, sto- noir story. And borders are you know, they can be water, they can be land, they can be manufactured, or they can be spiritual borders. But yeah, I had never written just about, you know, the immigrant crisis from Cuba to Miami, the idea that so many people took this perilous journey and not as many survived, you know, the, you know, many died in the waters, many, many died before they got off the island, many made it and thrived, which is fantastic. But I think a lot of people, you can get lost in the numbers, like kind of in the same way that a lot of people you know, lose focus with the pandemic because they just see a number, but they're humans, like those numbers are people. And, you know, the people that didn't make it across the Florida Straits to to the Keys from Cuba are real stories. And so I wanted to craft one story that evoked that. And, uh, you know, it really resonated. It won the Anthony Award the next year. So, and, and it was also included in the Best American Mystery Stories of, uh, of 2021, which mm-hmm. was a huge honor. It is. Um, now we're going to start talking about secret identity, but I want to bring up two pop culture um cuban figures in america um okay desi arnaz Mm -hmm. and uh the movie scarface (laughs) i mean i love i love lucy yeah so yeah so what what's your impression of those two uh those two entities in pop culture um i watched scarface a lot as a kid uh probably not ideal but even as a kid i was like that (laughs) that does not yeah that does not look like the miami i know even the miami of when i was younger but I think it's it's an interesting movie. I love Brian De Palma. I think he has made some great films. I I, I I'm not going to rewatch it because I don't think it gets better every time I watch. It. You know, it's just like <laughs> Pacino is like chewing up the scenery. It's got some great performances. I think Michelle Pfeiffer is amazing in that movie, and uh, you know Stephen Bauer. It's it's not the greatest crime film, but it's entertaining in its audacity. And I guess like how, yeah, you, you know, in your face it is. Um, I can admire it for that, but it's definitely not on par with something like Goodfellas or The Godfather or go. that kind of like um, epic saga. Like it's, it's, it's a gangster movie. It's a fun gangster movie. Like you can't, if you take it too seriously, you're going to be disappointed. Um, and Desi Arnaz is amazing. Like, you know, I, I grew up on I Love Lucy as a kid, just watching the black and white reruns. And it was just so cool to see, you know, my grandparents were like, oh, he's Cuban. And that was so amazing to see, like yeah. someone like us, like even back then was was a force. And um, yeah, so. Yeah, no, that's cool. He did a lot of production uh, on that mm-hmm. show too. So he was a bigger deal than I think a lot of people even knew, even though yeah. he already was a big deal. So let's talk about Secret Identity. It has released this month. Uh, so it's about Carmen Valdez. She's a writer from Miami who lives in New York very much in in a similar 
pattern as you also mm-hmm. uh, being Cuban from, from Miami, living in New York and working in, in, in the publishing world. What I love is the scenery of, of the way you describe New York, but it's also New York of 1975. So tell us what went into that and, and at why 1975? Why did you write this story? Yeah, 19, that's a great question. 1975 to me is a point in the comic book industry's history that is in stark contrast to today. You know, today, as you know, or as anyone listening probably knows, like comics are everywhere. Like the source material is what it is, but the awareness of comics is insanely high, or at least the awareness of the characters. So you have stuff like, you know, a Green Arrow TV show that's been running forever or a Peacemaker TV show or Ant-Man movie or Guardians of the Galaxy, like IP that maybe when you and I were kids were interesting, but were not like front list or A-list yeah. characters. It, it was it was more of a subculture back then. Yeah, exactly. And so in 1975 too, you're not really in the full swing of the secondary market hasn't started. So you have maybe some comic shops, but they're not as prevalent. The secondary market and conventions aren't as big a thing. Like Phil Suling is starting his shows um, you're starting to see people buy and, and deal in back issues, but it hadn't become a part of the industry as a default setting, you know, like DC would later like create comics just for the direct market, you know, and Marvel would do the same, like, you know, yeah. Dazzler or new Titans. And-, and that stuff wasn't happening in 75. Yeah. Yeah. It hadn't started in 75. And I don't think the editorial infrastructure was in place to kind of treat these characters as ip in the sense of well you can't do that to spider-man because he's going to be a movie or you can't have that happen to robin because we're going to have a tv show you know even though there had been a batman show and there had been some stuff it wasn't as prevalent or as you know uh, as big a part so i really wanted to show an industry that not only didn't have the same structure but also was kind of at a low point in terms of success like the newsstand wasn't really thriving i think you you know you had stuff like the dc implosion or things that were you know like the newsstand you have to print as as having known known the newsstand because of my time at archie like you have to overprint to sell a fraction basically you have that's right yeah there's a print run and then there's a sell-through rate and that sell-through rate determines the success of that of that print run yeah yeah, and, and but then at the same time, so while the business itself might not be doing as well, and while maybe onlookers think, oh, well, comics are dying creatively, it's probably one of the more fertile times for traditional company owned characters because unlike now, you don't have the, they didn't have the option of going to Image or going to Oni or going to Dark Horse and creating their own IP and selling it and making it their own thing. So they kind of, the creators had to pour themselves into these buckets like these existing characters and make them their own and really give them quirks and personality traits that were unique to the time and it wasn't like editors would stop them because there was other stuff happening other exploitation happening it was it was pre-shooter so when i think when shooter came in at marvel he really laid down the law and kind of you know teed up the company to become what it became yeah yeah he he's the one that made it ip aware really yeah, and the same thing was happening at DC, but I think there was this this period in the mid '70s where it was a little bit like the Wild West in terms of what was happening was. with the characters. It was pretty trippy stuff, and yeah. I remember early on before I started putting, I was in the research phase of the book. I got to Sean Howe was very kind. Sean Howe, the author of Marvel: The Untold Story, very kindly gave me his time, and I said, you know, it's, see, I was still trying to figure out when to set the book. I knew what the mystery was, but I was trying to figure out when to do it. And I said, it seems like you're really keen on the '70s, and he basically confirmed what I thought that it was just such a excuse me such a vibrant period and so and there there's a certain darkness of it like there's a lot of shadows that every people could hide in and still make comics Um, exactly and and that's what's interesting about and that's how the 80s was not that way um there there was no shadow there's a lot of oversight I think in 75 I think it was like Marv Wolfman Mm -hmm. um and and Len Wein as uh uh, editors editors in chief and there there was this uh whole there's this whole thing with i remember i talked to marv wolfman he was like we mm-hmm. were just trying to like figure out there were so many books at that point because the new distribution through curtis circulation way more books than what one one editor-in-chief could really even look, yeah. look at every day yeah there was no month. you know shooter always said oh i read every book but i, I think back then there was just not only were Marvin Len writing a ton of stuff, they had yeah. to manage the whole process. So you saw yeah. a lot of little fiefdoms, like writer yeah. editors, like right. who who had control of their own little little yes. worlds. And, and it was and very was unregulated and very it was pure in a way as yeah. far as a creator intent standpoint. 
uh, but but maybe not uniform as far as a corporate house style of writing styles. Yeah, definitely. And also, I was really curious about not only what was happening at Marvel and DC, but what was happening at these other publishers that were a little bit smaller that were trying to compete with Marvel at the and DC. Yeah. Yeah. Places like Atlas Seaboard, yeah. you know, Harvey to some degree, obviously with the kids' comics, um, you know, Charlton Quality. The list goes on. And so I was I was really fascinated by the idea of setting the book not only in 1975, but not. Legally, I couldn't have said it at Marvel or DC. I guess I yeah. could have. It would have just taken a lot more nuance than I had the patience right, for. Right. Um, so I wanted to evoke the era, and I wanted to give the reader a sense of verisimilitude that, you know, if you, you know, you could imagine that this did happen in the same way that Chabin did it so well with Cavalier and Clay, like, he weaves through history and you think, well, maybe there could have been the escapist and maybe, yeah. you know, Cavalier and Clay did exist. And, um, those are my favorite kind of historical fiction books. Um, right. Did you read uh, Hey Kids comics, Howard Chaikin's stuff? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's and there's, you know, in Bad Weekend by Brew Baker yeah. and, and Phillips, which kind of so, something I find in those is that there's always a character or a character in that in those books. They're always at least 51 percent a real person. Uh, and and that's how mm -hmm. I kind of look at there's at least 51 percent a guy that they had in mind when they put that role down and um, yeah you know i get that question a lot like oh was uh there's a, an artist that carmen works with that draws the first few link stories like oh was doug detmer or like yeah jack jack cole or alex toe you know who i imagined him as um i i, I thought of him more as like a, a fusion character because mm -hmm. but he's definitely a fusion character as far as the way i saw it uh but but there's definitely like a wally wood alcoholism aspect to him that i really got that i really connected with uh because it reminded me a lot of the way jim shooter described his last interaction with wally wood in 1980 mm -hmm. and how gaunt and awful and just self-destroyed yeah he came uh and, and and i felt that with uh with detmer but but he sounded like a fusion character um from what i was reading him. i think if you want to do it right you, you never want it to feel like you don't want it to feel like comic book trivia where someone's just trying to figure out who they are. Like you want yeah. to hit the archetype. Like obviously the, De the Detmer character is an archetype, but you also want to make yeah. him feel unique. You want to amalgamate the things you find interesting from history yeah. and research. The, 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 the guy that played this, the, the, and the cyborg and aliens, that's who I, I kept imagining Detmer looking like that guy. <laughs> oh i could see that yeah i uh yeah i cast him as kind of like anthony edwards from er there you go yeah, yeah. like an older kind of beat up version of that yeah, yeah just kind of worn out and um but yeah a lot of the characters so the big picture on secret identity it tells the story of carmen valdez who's a cuban-american woman who comes from miami to new york to pursue her dream in 1975 of writing comics and she um she gets a gig as a secretary to the publisher editor in chief at this company called Triumph. And Triumph, yeah. like I said, is very much like a third rate comic publisher. Triumph Comics, the editor, uh, Carlisle. Jeffrey Carlisle, yeah. yeah. And he's also another example of like an archetypical like company head in that era, but he's not, he's a little bit of Stan. To me, he felt like a mixture of um, Chip Goodman and Stan Lee like combined is how I kind of kept thinking of him yeah yeah with a little bit of uh jim warren i think there you go yeah there you go mm -hmm. yeah but definitely not and and some new stuff some other stuff that i added right obviously because right. you want to make the characters your own so she gets this job as a, as a secretary for to carlisle and she's pitching him stories she's saying you i want to write this character i want to do this and he he basically tells her it's not going to happen. I have yeah. a line of I have a line of freelancers out the door of my friends that I have to keep fed. And, you know, maybe someday you'll be an editor and someday you can run this place with me. But that's that's not what she wants. She wants to write yeah. comics. Um, and, and, and there was a, a certain sexism, uh, maybe subconscious for uh, sure uh, that that was present there. That whole glass ceiling. You know, it's funny. Some people say, you know, that that it's not real, but it, but it is actually real especially from her perspective she's cuban and she's a female so there's mm -hmm. definitely a glass ceiling maybe it's subconscious from some of these people that that you mentioned but it was really yeah. interesting to, to almost be front and center to that conversation that you put in there yeah because he says it so blithely he's just like well look it's just not going to work out here's this other thing and i think he clearly underestimates how passionate she is about this opportunity yeah. and so then she's approached by a colleague, Harvey Stern, who's about her a little young, younger than she is. He's a junior editor at Triumph, and he has sussed out that she wants to write comics because yeah. they're friend, they're friends. And he basically says, you know, Carlisle's given me this assignment to launch a new female superhero. He hasn't told me anything else. I have to kind of do it whole cloth. Do you want to co-write it with me? But it has to be anonymous because 
you know, let, let, let's see how it goes. And then eventually you'll get your credit. But for now, let's do it anonymously just to get it out the door because it's an insane deadline. And so, you know, they launched this character called the Legendary Lynx, drawn by Doug Detmer, who, like we talked about, is this this beloved but also complicated artist, like very. Yeah. And, and he's burned a lot of bridges with publishers and yeah. has a bad temperament and uh, but super talented. Um, everyone just loves the stuff he does. He's just hard to work with usually. Right. Yeah. And so then he draws it, it becomes this huge hit, but at the same time, Harvey is murdered and Carmen finds him dead and she's kind of painted into a corner. She can't tell Carlisle because he won't, A, won't believe her and B would be upset that she did this like behind his back and she'd probably lose her job and any chance of like continuing to control the character um, because they turn in six scripts. The problem is all the scripts have Harvey's name and not Carmen's name. So no one has any idea that Carmen's written any part of this character. And so that that's what kind of spurs her into being this amateur sleuth where she has to figure out a, who killed her friend, because as complicated as Harvey is, she still has some affection for him as a friend. And more, you know, and part of it, too, is like, how can she reclaim this character, the links that, you know, is so tied into her, her, like, it's such a piece of her. Like, there's a yeah. scene early on that I love um, when they're brainstorming the character and Harvey's kind of coming at it at zero. Like, he's like, well, let's do this. Let's do this. And she busts out like a stack of notebooks and yeah. ideas. Like, I've been waiting for this. That she'd been writing her whole life, basically. Yeah, been building towards this moment my whole life, and now, now I've got it. So, even when Harvey did what he did, there was a certain sensitivity about the guy too that I felt you feel bad for him. That you that I felt was interesting. He wasn't just the straight up a hole of the comic or of the story. He was a uh, he he had a sense. There's a sense of side that she felt aware of, even though she was not attracted to him on any physical level. Mm -hmm. um, she she sensed that there was a certain damage in the guy and that she almost kind of felt a certain empathy toward him. I, I thought that was interesting that that two emotions of betrayal and empathy could exist in the same space, which is something that I think you had discussed a little bit of. Yeah, that's a great point. And it's, you know, look, it's a in, in these kind of stories, you want to show the shades of gray. And so obviously she's mad. She's betrayed and frustrated that someone she trusted basically took credit for her work. And then, you know, she, he couldn't control that he was killed. But, you know, now she has no control over her ideas. And at the same time, she feels bad, not just because he's murdered, but because she knows he's got a complicated life. You know, he yeah. he's opportun opportunistic, but also caring he's he's eager to climb the ladder but he's also empathetic to her and her plight and so yeah he's not a clear-cut villain i don't think there is a clear-cut villain in the story i mean there's a bad guy and there's a murderer and there's a crime but right. it's much more a character study i think than a pure like who done it yeah right um within the first couple chapters that jeffrey carlisle wanted to one day write the great american novel and i'm like okay <laughs> i know that yeah. line <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah <laughs> and yeah, i yeah, thought yeah. that was just so cool because it really it starts to already people who know about that, it kind of pulls them in already. Mm -hmm. um, and then you start to really pay attention. Maynard. <laughs> oh yeah. Maynard. Um, I like that. The whole bad Jim Morrison impersonator comment. Um, yeah. And then cool how, vibes. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he, how he, he takes acid before writing his, his comics of avatar and, uh, uh, you know, it's funny because I'm just thinking of Jim Starlin's Warlock and things like that. You know, yeah. when I'm when I'm when I was reading that, I was like, yeah, I kind of feel that because I, I love that. I love the Starlin Warlock. You know, I love yeah. Starlin and all that. Mm -hmm. I think you and I like a lot of the same comics, but um, but I, I I definitely related to a lot of these uh, uh, characters from the get go that I, I would pay attention whenever they were brought up like. What's going on with Maynard these days? Yeah, yeah, how's he doing? What's up with Maynard, man? Let's get more Maynard in yeah, here. Yeah, we need more know? Maynard. I, I mean, I it's I wanted to create these fictional characters and people that would then make me want to read those comics. Like, I want to read Avatar now. Yeah, I want to like I want to read, read Avatar. Yeah, yeah I want to I want to see how you know it, it felt to me like a blend of like yeah like warlock but also a little bit of Omega the Unknown like yeah and you, you have go. to imagine that if you're working on one of those like comics at not just marvel and dc that you have even less editorial oversight like so he was doing whatever the hell he wanted he was like just dropping acid and then writing comic scripts and sending them in and carlisle is torn because he hates it as a taste the taste his taste yeah. is not that but right. he also sees that it's their best-selling title so he can't like fire the guy so he's he's, he's also profit-minded um, yes. so that yes. was a lot of fun to kind of create this like lost chapter of comic book history i, I was reading this starlin um autobiography 
it's a picture a pictorial autobiography it's really nice but oh, um, cool. but uh, yeah he there was a mention that when he was doing invincible iron man not to say it was the best their best set on the title it wasn't but there was this note that like stanley just did not like what he was <laughs> yeah. doing there and he yeah. just wa- even though like people like uh, me or you you know were like this is cool stuff you know right um but yeah there was this thing where editorial the older editorial guys don't always get what the new guys want or the good new people want to want to read Berger was an interesting character because I almost got this sense like it was like a Dick Giordano type of guy but it wasn't it was definitely his own character and and I started getting a sense that he was his own character deeper into it but in the beginning I got a Dick Giordano vibe from the guy um yeah I could see that I think I wanted um I wanted to have a comic book insider that could kind of speak to the industry a little bit who had come to triumph with high hopes and was a little broken by the process like there's one line where he's like you know I was hired to do my job and my boss's job like I think a lot of people can sometimes relate to that that idea that you're you're doing your work but also you kind of have to make your boss look good and so he was doing the part of the of the editor-in-chief's job that Carlisle just didn't want to be bothered with like you know um and so it was fun to have him there and also to craft a friendship between him and Carmen that wasn't just like mentor mentee like they are definitely equals and they come together and talk about comics in a fun way and and that scene you'll appreciate this like a big thing about the book for me was creating the sense of atmosphere of working in comics and verisimilitude like if you're reading it and like you or I were a big big comics people you could read it and be like oh cool there's a nod to this or there's an easter egg there and if you're but if you're a casual reader maybe you're you're making notes and thinking oh i I need to read steve gerber or i need to read like yeah uh jim starlin so i try like that you you know they're being wikipedia during yeah while they're being yeah yeah but one of the things for me is i didn't want to default into like wikipediaing these people like i didn't want it to be like well, Carmen, Jim Starlin was born in so-and-so and, you know, uh, Walt mm-hmm. Simonson did yeah, this. Yeah, like, it's a it's a fictional narrative. You shouldn't, yeah. Yeah, but the one time I did take a little bit of a detour, and I think it worked, is when Berger, when Carmen is in Berger's office the first time and they're talking and he's handing, he hands her comics every now and again as, not as an education, but more as like a book trade. Like, these are things that I liked and I think you'll like them too as like a comic fan. And he hands her the first Denny O'Neill and Neil Adams Batman comic. Yeah, and yeah. Obviously, obviously we're playing the hits there. Like it's such a iconic story, but I, I went into a little more detail there talking about how important that run was or yeah. not really. And, ha- you know, and how we, it made Batman dark again, something like that, yeah, right? Yeah, it returned him to his roots as like yes. this dark Avenger. Yeah. And so that was fun. Um, I mean, the, I had a blast writing the book. It was really like, I, I had no complaints during the journey. As hard as writing a novel is, you know, you get lost in the in the weeds sometimes. But yeah, um, it was so fun, not just from comics, but from New York, from a music perspective. It was really fun. And um, there was some some references which I found uh, interesting. The Kurtzberg Avenue, Lieber Lane, right, would be kind of thrown in there. And I, and I almost, although they were, yeah, names of Jack Kirby and Stan Lee. Um, Maybe I'm reading into it, but but maybe they were also references within the context of the conversation, because you mentioned it overtly, I think, later down the road of the 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 creator not getting credit for contributing to writing a story. And and maybe those names were mentioned as a um, insider kind of hint toward the concept, um, because later you did write that phrase that uh, Jack Kirby didn't get a lot of writer credit uh, for those stories. Yeah, I think, you know, look, the tragedy here is that when you read Secret Identity, you're not feeling like Carmen is the sole person ever wronged by the comic book industry in terms of getting yeah. credit or right. or controlling their IP or creation. So, you know, there are a lot of, you know, I, I drew inspiration from a lot of real stories, like, and obviously Kirby's story, um, Bill Finger's story was hugely influential in this idea of like creating an iconic character in secret, like Bill Finger, like that's that saga has been uh, chronicled in many different ways. But um, yeah, as for like Lieber and Kurtzberg, you know, it, I think that was more just like a fun nod, but you, you probably caught the echo that was subconscious for me while writing it. Now, it's not just the comics, although another pop culture reference I want to bring up. I love mm-hmm. that you mentioned that there the 1975 New York convention of comic art and Walter Gibson and Jack Kirby on a panel together. You, you mentioned that in the in the story. Because in 1975, Walter Gibson was making rounds at comic conventions. Mm-hmm. And that's actually where there are a lot of photos of 
Jim Steranko and Walter Gibson together at conventions in 1975 specifically. Yeah. They also set up like a shadow club of some kind in 75. But but it's just cool that 75 and how you brought well, the Walter Gibson stuff in there at the Commodore Hotel, you know, cockroaches, rats or whatever was being referenced. Um, mm -hmm. it, it really, uh, it did evoke the sense of being there um, for me. Oh, good, I, yeah. I've, I've talked with people who were there, you know. It's so funny because, um, and we'll, I'm sure we'll get into the comic book sequences in a bit, is I sent Sandy Gerald, the artist who did the comic sequences, um, the draft of the novel so he could read and then do the interstitial parts. Um, and he was at that show. He was at that 1975 show. And he was like, well, so I, it's almost like he ran into Carmen as well. Um, but I also felt like I, it would have been a missed opportunity if I didn't note something like, you know, Gibson and Kirby together, because it, it is literally that's what the book is about. It's a blend yeah. of pulp and noir and superhero comics. And that felt like such a natural fit and just like, you know, pure coincidence, but also the kind of coincidence you can't ignore. Those are founding fathers of a lot of the, the, the comic fiction that we read, mm -hmm. um, even though Walter Gibson's uh, foray in comics was more of like these random magician comics in the 40s uh, and early 50s, but it was his work on the shadow that a lot of Batman, you know, came from with Bill Finger. Um, yeah, uh, and there's a lot of echoes to like Patricia Highsmith, who's one of my favorite crime writers, but she also wrote a lot of Golden Age comics anonymously, and so there's echoes of that in there. Yeah. Um, you know, at one point, without spoiling anything, Carmen uses uh, Patricia Highsmith's pseudonym Claire Morgan at one point, and. Yeah, so there's like little, no yeah. With that uh, fan Alfred, that had yeah. that, yeah, I'm not going to describe it. Okay, one thing, and I'm not going to spoil anything about okay. that scene, but <laughs> there's something about that line that it just danced in my mind was mm -hmm. when he was sitting on his cat a, a couch with one black cat on each side. <laughs> it's I intense. was like, what? I mean, I'm like imagining like this vampire, you know, uh, yeah. guy that uh, has this weird ominous knowledge and um, and something about that sentence just, uh, I thought it was genius. Uh, it really okay. kind of uh, established <laughs> what a what a weird guy that is. Uh, yeah, I mean, and, and every industry has people like that, like just people that are so passionate about the minutia of stuff that is amazing to me. Like it's, it's yeah, he, I, and that's the thing with all these characters is that I loved writing them is that you want to follow even the supporting characters, like someone like Marion, who was supposed to just show up in the volleyball game. Like when I wrote her, she was just going to be this mysterious like femme fatale type that shows up in the volleyball game and never to be seen again. And then she becomes this integral part of the last act of the book. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh. Um, now, um, there's also flashbacks in it, which which I found interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, it's not easy to wrap the modern moment into a flashback in novel form mm -hmm. because uh, in a movie, you clearly know, you know, that the scenery just changed. You're using words to establish um, the character processing current information while remembering past information. Was that right. tricky for you to um, to kind of nuance that? Yeah, I mean, it's challenging because you don't want it to just be a chapter break and like, hey, now we're in flashback land and this yeah. is what happened. I, I like to weave it into the present. So there's one scene, I think, when Carmen is you know, she's had a few drinks and she's feeling dizzy and delirious and she's having flashbacks to Miami and her past relationship. And, and I wanted to weave it in. So she almost becomes like an unreliable narrator at some point. You're just like wondering like what is going through her mind and is she okay? Like she's buttoned up and really put together for most of the book. And then she just kind of breaks at that point. And that, I thought that was really an interesting uh, trajectory to take her down. And um, I think the challenge with flashbacks is you have to make it count because it's really easy to get lost in flashbacks and just like yeah. kind of, you know, pedal aimlessly but it has to be it has to be relevant to the present day story otherwise you're just kind of spinning your wheels yeah that's right and i think a lot writing a lot of long form stuff you almost have to sacrifice some extraneous things and delete that and keep it pertinent to keep everyone on track so yeah it's interesting because like in, and this is a testament to my editor zach wagman who was very smart about um keeping it focused and keeping it in carmen's head is that in addition to the comic book interludes, we had like historical interludes to the comic press. So it op the book initially opened up on an almost academic paper from something like the Comics Journal talking about like, you know, the sad story of Triumph Comics and then like a wizard interview with Jeffrey Carlisle in the late 90s. And then um, there was a scene of Carmen at a comic convention at the end where she, you know, there was just things that didn't make the cut 
and for good reason, but that I'll probably find a home for somewhere. But it was just yeah. like, you know, sometimes you have to kill your darlings. That's the, so it's a, the cliche yeah. is very true to keep it, to keep people on the ride of the whole yeah. thing. Um, so then uh, now some more pop culture references that are not comic related, but were important, I felt, to establish the scenery of New York City. I mentioned earlier, you mentioned Velvet Underground and that type of music. Uh, I love the Andy Warhol reference because I think a lot of people now almost forget how yeah. important he was in pop culture from like late 60s to like early 80s. But 70s, I and mean, this is his post-shooting era before, mm -hmm. after he got shot, he was so interrelated with what people were seeing visually in New York City when it came to pop culture and the arts. Tell us about what kind of research you were doing into New York City of the 70s that you were bringing these kind of elements in. Yeah, so I mean, in addition to you know, the comic book research and interviews I had to do just to get the comic book stuff right and the Carmen stuff right. I had to really give it, I didn't want it to just feel like, hey, it's New York 1975 and, and wing it. I wanted it to really feel like you were there. Um, there's a great book called Love is a Building on Fire by Will Hermes and it chronicles like his youth in the seventies in New York and the music scene, but it's not just the CBGB stuff. It's not just like Max's Kansas City, which is all like that to me is great, but it's also like Latin music and jazz and uh, avant-garde music. I also read a really great, um, I'm blanking on the author, uh, a great Lou Reed biography that really focused on that era. You know, the tail end of the Velvet Underground and the seediness of New York, but also the 70s and Lou kind of coming out of his shell and becoming yeah. a solo artist. Um, and so I used a lot of that to kind of get a sense of the music scene and also New York, like the texture of New York, that it was very different, like comics in 1975, New York in 1975 was totally different from the New York of today. It was much oh, more yeah. dangerous and, you know, kind of falling apart. It felt like, you know, a lot of people weren't sure the city was going to survive in terms right. of, you know, financially, structurally, you know, Gerald Ford told New York to go to hell. Like, they, you know, it's, you know, it's drop dead. I mean, um, and so it was <laughs> and, just. And, and that was also true of just the newsstand comic book industry at that time, because there wasn't this clear cut method of the direct market saving comics. People were thinking that a lot of things about New York, including comic books, were all just going to come to an end soon. Yeah, it was falling apart. And I think that is in such stark contrast to what we see today, which is fun, which is great. Like, I think the fun of a novel for me is when it takes you somewhere else, like to an industry or a place or a, a culture that you're not familiar with and kind of walks you through it as best they can. Um, and so I wanted to feel immersive, but also not like I was rattling off facts to like prove my cred, I guess. Now, there was also a mention of Pedro Fernandez in this story <laughs> yeah um, uh, so is this a shared universe then uh with uh with your other stuff yeah a friend of mine joked around because there's also mention to some other stuff like the black ghost and the dusk and the freedom alliance is a, a, a team of characters i'm going to be writing in another book um yeah like calling it like the segura expanded universe but yeah this all happens in the same world as like pete fernandez there's actually two pete fernandez references like one reference to his dad and then there's another one that no one has gotten unless i yeah. explain it to them so i won't spoil it for you but um if you read miami midnight and then you read secret identity and and like look at the names you'll see some connective tissue that is yeah. not as obvious yeah the comic pages uh they it was interesting because they were placed there would be like a narrative page of comic art and there would be some theme that seemed to speak to what Carmen was going through mm -hmm. at the time. Tell us about constructing those. Yeah, so it kind of dates back to reading Cavalier and Clay as a kid, not a kid, I was in my 20s, but reading that book and just loving it because for the first time I felt like comics were woven into a novel in such an interesting way. It felt like literature and comics were blending together and comics are of course literature in their own way, but um, I'd never read a comic that, ex uh, I'd never read a novel that explored the industry. And so it felt like it was written just for me, but the one thing I wanted to kind of pull out of it was I had wanted to read the escapist comics. Like, you know, you're, you're reading the novel and I wanted to read those comics and, and later they eventually published them through Dark Horse, which was cool, but I had, part of me wished that they were part of the novel. So you're reading the novel and then you get pulled into the comic. Um, and so that idea was always in the back of my mind. So when I knew I was gonna do this comic book noir, I knew out of the gate, I told my agent, I was like, we have to have comics in it. And he kind of was like, are you sure? Like, that's a whole like procedural thing. Like, it's not just a prose book. It's, it adds a whole complication to it. Um, but I also knew who I needed to draw it. Um, Sandy Gerald is amazing. Like he loves, he's, 
he's not just a great artist. He's like a comic book history buff. Like he does these amazing recreations of classic covers. He, he, uh, he showed me this Hawkman cover that he did like a, a mock showcase cover. And that's when I really knew I was like, he's the guy because not only does that feel like something that could have existed, it doesn't feel like he's imitating anyone. You know, I wanted, I wanted an artist that was going to evoke the era, but not feel like, Oh, that's just Sandy, like imitating Frank Miller or that's Sandy imitating like, um, you know, any artist of the era, like Gene Colan or what have you. Um, and so I talked him through it. I sent him the outline for the novel and a big chunk of the pages, like of the prose. And the interstitials were already there. And the idea was that as you're reading the, the novel, it's going to pull you into the comics for like a break, like you get a mental yeah. break. But those comic sequences are definitely meant to evoke the mood of the story because it's Carmen who's creating most of them, except for one. Yeah. Um, and then well, yeah, two, right? It was two issues that were by that other team, right? Right, 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 right. Two yeah. issues, but like one page that's actually shown. But one page is shown, you're right, yeah. Yeah, and so the idea, but I, I just didn't want it to feel perfunctory. And by that, I mean, like, I didn't want someone to read it and say, oh, he's just got comics in here just to have them. Like, they have no bearing on the story. It's just yeah, like showing it off. has to fit with your narrative. It has to fit the story and it has to feel like it adds to the story so much so that if you just read the prose, you would be missing part of the heart of the story because you didn't get the comics. Um, and so Sandy, Sandy and I worked Marvel method where I would give him like a few sentences of story and say, you know, I think this will be two or three pages, you know, show the links jumping over some rooftops. She captures a guy and then it closes on a close up and she's surprised. Um, and then he would lay it out and we'd go back and forth and then I would do the script and then Taylor Esposito, who was the letterer would, he, he figured out a font that made it look like it was hand lettering, which I was blown away by because it just looks so of the time. And like I said, I didn't want it to feel like someone imitating, like someone's riffing yeah. on like a retro take, but you know, like something that could have existed at that time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It was very effective. Um, oh, good. I, I <laughs> was the, also you're the target audience for the authenticity of that. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I also like, you know, the, the little Ben Day kind of approach on the dots. The the mm -hmm. question, the, the, the thing that I would kept paying attention to, though, was the credits on the bottom. Oh, I kept, I kept hmm, who's credited on that page? Yeah. And I'm like, damn it, it's not her yet. Like, I was, um, I was feeling, uh, and then, and then you would see, like, uncredited i'm like Ugh! yeah <laughs> exactly yeah. Um, just uh and that i i like how um that developed along with the events in the story that i just kept you know yeah i'd read the page and you know i liked the you know i liked what it did narratively and i liked the character i liked the art and all that mm -hmm. the authenticity of it but um the credits i just kept like hmm uh, okay you know yeah it, i mean I, I put those in there for myself like that's the kind of thing i would look at so i know that like fellow fans of stuff like that would be looking at those details like you know like the letterer todd morelli that's a nod to like todd klein and jack morelli like two of the best letters in the industry like just a little yeah. like little hat tip there um and then there is one sequence like we were talking about that is not written by carmen not drawn by doug detmer and that's one yeah. kind of she totally loses control of the character. They're no longer working off her scripts. Yeah. Um, and you just yeah. see the huge tonal shift and how it's unlike anything she did. It lacks yeah. the heart or the passion. Link's, uh, Link's uh, number seven. I've memorized yeah. the issue. <laughs> yeah, I've already exactly. memorized the issue number. Um, yeah. But but the interesting thing, uh, I remember when I was interviewing uh, Trina Robbins that one time, we talked about... Oh, that was a huge influence, That's that interview. Oh, it was. Oh, I'm glad. Well, there, there was this topic that I brought up with her that really fascinated me was the two different approaches that writers approach uh, a female character. And there is the, I, I kind of break it up into the, the Bill Wagon, Katie Keene approach, which is like, you know, more of a, of a, of a positive character, pro-female, pro-young female for mm -hmm. impressionable young female. And then there is the, you know, the Bill Ward, Torchy um, kind of fetishized aspect. Right. Uh, to appeal to the the juvenile, sexualized, sexually obsessed uh, teenagers that would yeah. be reading it for um, some sort of, you know, more of a perverse gratification. Right. And, and I'm not judging um, one, you know, this versus that. I'm not saying, but I would say, though, that that's, that was an interesting example of seeing that in your book. It, it started out as uh, kind of like the Katie Keene aspect and then it becomes mm -hmm. this torchy thing for like two issues uh because the creators that weren't intended to write that character then kind of took over 
right. uh, that character. And, and I thought that was really effectively demonstrated. Um, it, it almost feels like a lot of people who don't know about comics, they're going to learn these funny themes uh, as, as they go through your book. I almost feel like you're translating a lot of the comic stuff to like yeah. a mainstream audience through this uh, mystery novel. And, and I thought that is just so, uh, I think it's like important, right? It gives people this sense of, of the industry in a way that's uh, entertaining and fun. Although that's not, the primary objective is to tell a good story, but, yeah. but it does seem to have that, that secondary function to it, right? Yeah, for sure. I really wanted to show with that sequence in particular, just how much a comic can change. Like, I think a lot of people casual, you know, people who aren't into comics don't understand that tonally a whole story can change depending on who's writing or drawing it. And that sounds silly to say on a comic book podcast, but you know, if you're not a comic person, you just think yeah. comics are produced and they're just churned out. And right. that's how a lot they're of people born. don't know that there's different versions of. Yeah. Yeah. And so like something like the links that was a passion project for Carmen, a passion project for Detmer suddenly gets handed to two hacks for lack of a better term yeah, yeah. Just are, are cranking it out and obviously are going for the lowest common denominator. It's yeah. a big shift. It's a total shift in the content and the intent. Right. And so I wanted to show that and really kind of get to the gut of what sometimes happens with comics. You know, I got to send the book to Trina Robbins and I, I obviously it was very indebted to her work. I'm looking at some of her books on my shelf now, yeah. but it was that interview you guys did that really added a lot of texture to the brainstorming for the book and you know the podcast is thanked in, in the acknowledgments but there were so many interviews that you know it's not like you guys were doing a lot of the work for me but you spoke to a lot of people that I wanted to speak to already oh, cool. and so I got it got a lot of texture from like your what, conversations. What, what were some of the other uh, interviews you would say were some sort of influence in this? Uh, the Trina Robbins one, obviously the long one you did with Paul Levitz. I, I mean I've known Paul for a long time and I consider him a good friend and um but that really gave me a kind of a one-on-one on his career that I didn't really know off the top of my head. Um, you did spotlights on some of the smaller publishers like Atlas Seaboard, which I found fascinating. Yeah, and, uh, and I think there was one on, on Harvey where you, on yeah. Harvey Comics, where, where it wasn't so much about the content, but like this idea of a, you know, C level or B level publisher and how they existed during that time yeah. um, that I found really fascinating. Yeah, and uh, and how they were so incompatible with the um, direct market of the 80s. Yeah, that it just kind of fell apart, yeah. Yeah, at that point, it's not the newsstand anymore, so it's not about a random kid walking by. It's about 13-year-old boys that want violence and sex uh, yeah. at their comic shops. and that... Exactly, they, they, they don't want the casual, like, cartoon stuff. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, Warren Magazine seemed to fall apart for a similar reason. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I really just, the podcast became, like, this this assistant, you know, like you guys did so much research talking to so many key figures in the industry that it was really yeah. helpful to like tap into that for sure. That's, that's, that's really great. Uh, 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 much appreciated. Thank yeah, you so of course. much for, for mentioning that, mentioning, uh, uh, mentioning us in the, uh, in your acknowledgement, acknowledgements. Mm -hmm. That was very kind. For sure. Um, another couple of historical precedents to the concept of another creator coming in. Cause you've been mentioned in there that sales had like spiked up actually with a new, yeah. um, when Ramita took over for Ditko, that's another example of, of maybe the intent of the auteur being changed, but then the sales mm -hmm. responded positively to it. Although I love that, and that's not fetishized, but it's different. Um, it's totally, yeah, just so totally different from what totally Ditko different. was doing. Yeah. And then another one was Scorpion that uh, Chaikin made for Atlas, how in like the first one or two issues, it was, you know, his Dominic Fortune character, mm -hmm. but then when he left the book because Martin Goodman didn't like his stuff, it becomes this other scorpion, which is like this bouncy guy in tights. And, and so such a lame uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. character. And I almost kind of felt like that happened with the lethal links in that sense. So there was the fetishized, but then there was also like making it more like a bubble gummy version of, of the original uh, creator. Yeah, and it's such, a, you know, stuff like that is so common in comics where the tone is 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 so tied to the creator. And if a creator is changed, like you see it also when like Frank Miller becomes writer and artist, like when he's the artist yeah. with Roger McKenzie scripting, yeah. it still feels like a traditional superhero comic, though the art is different. But then when he takes over as writer, the whole vibe is different. And so I wanted to sh definitely show how, how major a change that could be. Yeah, and he did. Um, wonderful. And I know we don't want, we're not going to spoil the end, uh, for anybody. No. <laughs> so I think I read like 80% of it in a day just to like figure out who 
and what happened, um, mm-hmm. which uh, I thought was uh, really interesting. You, you, you touched upon the importance of IP and mm-hmm. characters as some sort of uh, bankable product at some point down the line, uh, which I thought was uh, also an interesting take because I think in the mid seventies, although they knew that sort of, yeah, I, I don't think they were really, uh, like you said, they weren't really in the cartoons as big of a deal and as in movies. And so if I know that Stan Lee, he wanted to push comics into the magazines and then he was the one that was really going to LA and trying to make these things into TV shows. Um, so in a sense he knew, although uh, Kirby, I think created more stuff than he did, but he was important in transferring that material to other me- uh, to other media. So yeah, totally. I think, um, yeah, without spoiling anything, that's obvious. That's a, you know, the book is in many ways like a meta look at intellectual property and what happens when you lose control and what the value of a character is. And in 1975, I don't think as many people, obviously today, it's all about like, what is the value of this IP? Like, what can it be elsewhere? Uh, whereas back then in comics, it was a little more intangible. So it's a, yeah, I don't want to give away the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, maybe in five years, we'll give away the end. Uh, yeah, we can have a <laughs> postmortem. <laughs> Alex, uh, any any further comments you want to make about Secret Identity that people should know about? Yeah, I mean, at first, at its heart, it's a mystery. It's a mystery novel. It's meant to entertain. My favorite kind of mysteries are the ones that take you somewhere else and show you a world that maybe you've never lived in or you're not familiar with. So I hope that people that love comics get a kick out of it like you and I did, you know, just seeing all the hat, tri- you know, the hat tips and Easter eggs and nods to the world we love. But I hope also that people that just read, you know, want to read a fun mystery in, a, in an industry that they're not familiar with will enjoy it and maybe come out of it wanting to pick up a stack of comics. And the big thing for me is I wanted to give this sense that maybe somewhere this triumph comics existed and maybe when you're kind of going through your back issues you'll find an issue of the legendary links and it won't seem crazy there you go i like it um well thank you alex thank you so much uh for being well, thanks here for having me. me um chatting uh chatting um and uh being a guest on the podcast uh really great you know i know we interact on twitter uh, yeah. quite a bit and uh it, it's nice to finally sit down and uh, go over this and go over your career i, I really appreciate it thanks so much oh, for thanks time. so much it's, it's an honor and a pleasure you know i'm a fan of the podcast and so it's really cool to to be a part of it thank you 